All right, good morning, everybody. So last time we were talking about the chemistry of amines. And how to make amines. What was the name reaction that we learned about? The Gabriel synthesis, right? So the Gabriel synthesis of amines. What kind of amines can we synthesize from the Gabriel synthesis? Primary amines. And so it works really well for the synthesis of primary amines because you start off with what? What's the reagent that we start off with? What is that? It is a nucleophile. It is potassium thalamide, right? We can make that from thalamide, which has a hydrogen here, and potassium hydroxide works pretty well. The pK of the hydrogen on there, on the starting materials, around 10, so it's easy to deprotonate. Now we have a pretty good nucleophile. We can react this with some sort of alkyl halide. I'm just going to pick on this one. This works pretty well for primary alkyl halides. Actually, it works really well for primary alkyl halides. Works okay for secondary alkyl halides. Tertiary alkyl halides, no go. Why? Okay. What do we know about tertiary alkyl halides? Do they undergo SN1 or SN2? They undergo SN1, and what kind of reaction is this? This is an SN2. And so all the rules that we learned about SN2 chemistry apply. Leaving group leaves. This works really well for iodide, bromide, and chloride. Tosylate works. Anything with a good leaving group, pretty much. We now have, how many carbons did I put in there? One, two, three, four. We now have our alkylated nitrogen. It cannot over-alkylate, even though there's still a lone pair of electrons on this nitrogen. And why can't it over-alkylate? Pardon? It's, those electrons are resonance delocalized throughout the two carbonyls. They're no longer nucleophilic. It's not always resonant. Sometimes it's steric, right? And so we have just generated the carbon-nitrogen bond that we want. Now all we have to do is remove all of this, which is a lot. And how do we do it? There were three ways I told you. What were they? Sodium hydroxide works. So if I take sodium hydroxide and I boil this up, I will get one, two, three, four. I get my amine plus I get that salt. Of course, it's the disodium salt. How else can we do it? Hydrazine is another way. It's my favorite way, actually. You can boil it up, but this will actually go at room temperature. It's just slower, <clears throat> and you will get your amine plus This hydrazide, as we call it, and it turns out that's not very soluble in the solvents that we use for this, and it precipitates out a solution. You filter it off, and you got your amine. That's why it's our favorite one. The other one, we, ha we typically have to do some type of chromatography. Another way in which you can do this is, of course, to boil it up in acid, like HCl and water. <clears throat> Under those conditions, however, you get the ammonium salt of the amine. Uh, 
whatever the counter ion is. I haven't identified it here. Um, <clears throat> and of course you get the acid. And so this is pretty convenient. You got three ways to deprotect it. This one is my favorite, but all three of them actually work pretty well. Um, seems kind of wasteful, doesn't it? Notice we're making a very small primary amine, and we've got all this stuff that we've got to throw away at the end. Uh, technically, you could take that and convert it back to the thalamide. Probably, yeah, for us it definitely is. Thalamide is actually pretty cheap. In fact, we buy it as the potassium salt already. <clears throat> and it's literally pennies on the gram. I mean, you're, you're, not, you're not paying a lot for it. So, yeah, recycling is just not terribly economical right at the moment. But you have to throw a lot away. Uh, the good news is, is this actually works fairly well at... Um, giving primary means. It's actually the reaction to give primary means. Now we talked about the fact that theoretically, right, we could use ammonia to do this, but why not? What keeps reacting? That's right. We ultimately get to quaternary ammonium salts, right? Because these substituted amines are actually more reactive than the ammonia. And then the product from that alkylation is actually more reactive than, and this is just a cascade. So if you want to make quaternary ammonium salts, it's a great way to do it, right? But a lot of times we want to make primary, secondary, or tertiary amines. And if we want to make primary amines, the great way to do that is through the Gabriel synthesis. It works really, really well. Are there any questions about that before we get started on today's stuff? Has everybody got it? Have we got what they want? Yes? So. Again, we finished off with talking about the Gabriel synthesis of primary means, and again, it works really, really well if you have a methyl, like methyl iodide or methyl bromide or primary. It will work with secondary, but it's less useful there because you always get a little bit of elimination, and tertiaries only give elimination in tertiary alkyl halides. Okay. There are other ways to make amines. Uh, you can make a mean, you can make primary, secondary, or tertiary means by the reduction of the appropriate nitro compound. Notice nitro compounds have a carbon nitrogen bond. All we have to do is what kind of reaction to convert the nitro into an amine? That's right. We just have to simply reduce off the oxygens and we can get a primary amine there pretty well. Notice the types of reducing agents that we can use are quite varied. Hydrogen and palladium on carbon readily reduces nitro groups to amino groups, no problem. What might be the problem with using hydrogen and palladium on carbon, though? Yeah, we might have a double bond that we want to preserve, right? And then so if the R group has an alkene that we want to leave as an alkene, that's a horrible choice. But fortunately for us, you can simply take a bucket of nails and some hydrochloric acid, iron and HCl. It will reduce nitro groups uh, and by and large leave other functional groups alone. You can also use tin metal and hydrochloric acid. Uh, and there's a whole uh, other series of things that you can do, but these are the common ones. You can either catalytically reduce it or you can stoichiometrically reduce it with iron or tin in the presence of hydrochloric acid. We can also make primary amines from nitriles. And how do we make nitriles? <clears throat> how do we make a nitrile? Uh, 
No. S and two chemistry with what? <coughs> and what? Cyanide, right? Right, so I can take an alkyl halide and I can react it with cyanide and I can get a nitrile that I can then reduce to a primary amine. The reduction for this is typically lithium aluminum hydride. We've already talked about that in the previous chapter because these are kind of like carboxylic acid derivatives, right? So we can make them that way. So if we're starting off with an alkyl halide, why not just do the Gabriel synthesis? What's the difference between the Gabriel synthesis and going through a nitrile? <clears throat> okay, I don't have all that other stuff that I'm going to have to deprotect at the end, right? In the Gabriel synthesis, the number of carbons that I have in my alkyl halide is how many carbons I'm going to have in my final product, right? How many carbons will I have here? That number plus one, right? Because cyanide has a carbon in and of itself. So if you have an alkyl halide and you need to add one carbon and an amine, this is the great way to do it. So you could just simply take this, reduce it with lithium aluminum hydride first, then quench it with water and you get a primary amine. Other ways to make amines <coughs> is by the reduction of amides. How do we make amides? S close. No. Really what we need is a carboxylic acid and an amine, but I can't just put a carboxylic acid and amine together because I'll get acid-base chemistry, not uh, acyl substitution. So what do I need? Instead of a carboxylic acid, what would I use? Aldehyde. Not an aldehyde. Not an Technically, yeah, I could use an ester. <coughs> all right, you got me there. Acyl chloride is the common one that you all know about, right? So if you take an acid chloride and an amine, we can make amides very, very easily. It's an extremely easy reaction to do. You just take the two, mix them together, and voila, you've got the product, right? But we can reduce each one of these into the respective amine using lithium aluminum hydride. So if you take a primary amide, you will reduce it to a primary amine. You're just removing the carbon double bond oxygen replacing it with hydrogen. I could take a secondary amide and I can reduce it to a secondary amine. And I can take a tertiary amide and I can reduce it to a tertiary amine. So if I want to make tertiary amines, I think about ways in which I can make tertiary amines and then simply reduce it. Okay? Now the book talks about lithium aluminum hydride as the reducing agent, and it works just fine. Lithium aluminum hydride, though, has some drawbacks. Uh, the lithium and the aluminum salts that you get as byproducts sometimes make the workup really difficult. Not impossible, but difficult. And so if you're dealing with a simple amine that you want, you usually don't want to have to spend all that kind of time. There's another reagent that does this reaction very, very cleanly and very, very easy workup. Anybody know what it is? <coughs> it is a new one. Sodium cyanoborohydride? That's for a different one. Actually, our good old friend, borane. So borane THF, borane DMS, borane pyridine. B2H6, all those reagents. Where did we learn about those reagents before? Uh, <laughs> the generation of antimer common to cause alcohols, that's right. But boring will also, excuse me, I've got a little bit of a cold, will also uh, convert amides into amines pretty easily. Now, we can also do chemistry that we learned previously about taking carbonyls and an amine and getting imines, which is where I think you two were going, right? So remember, 
that a ketone or an aldehyde plus a primary amine or ammonia gives us an imine. Notice we have the carbon-nitrogen bond that we need for an amine if we simply reduce the pi bond, right? So all we need to do is reduce this pi bond, and lo and behold, we'll get our primary amine in this case. This works very, very well. So if we can take a ketone, ammonia, we can get a primary amine. We can take a ketone, we can take a primary amine, and we can get a secondary amine very, very easily because both of those go through imine intermediates, okay? And so we've already talked about this chemistry in the past, so we don't really need to focus on that. What we need to focus on is what are we going to use here as a reducing agent. And Yusuf's already mentioned the new reducing agent that we're going to learn. What is that? Sodium cyanoborohydride. And it's very, very selective for the reduction of imines. And I wish I could tell you exactly why. It's still kind of a mystery to me, actually. It doesn't really reduce carbonyls at all. But once it forms an imine, it gets reduced. And it's kind of a neat reaction that way. Okay? And so you can easily form amines quite easily uh, by just mixing uh, an amine with a carbonyl in the presence of sodium cyanoborohydride. So... Here we have a ketone, we have ammonia, sodium cyanoborohydride. Now ammonia, typically what they use is ammonium hydroxide, which is nothing more than ammonia in water because ammonium hydroxide is nonsense, but we stick with the name. You can't have NH4 plus and OH minus at the same time together, why? <coughs> no, it's soluble, but OH minus is a strong or a weak base. It's a fairly strong base, right? And NH4 is a, it's a pretty good acid. So a strong acid and a strong base existing at the same time? Nonsense. But for some reason it sticks, right? So it's really just aqueous ammonia, okay? It forms an imine and then sodium cyanoborohydride reduces the carbon-nitrogen double bond and you get the primary amine. Now if you take this molecule, phenyl acetone, React it with ammonia, sodium cyanoborohydride, you form amphetamine, which is a powerful stimulant. Okay? This is the chemistry that Walter White basically did, right? Except he didn't use ammonia. What did he use? What did he steal from the train card? Methylamine. That's right. So if you can get your hands on this, methylamine and some sodium cyanoborohydride, you could easily make methamphetamine pretty easily. Actually, very easily. But now think about it. You're buying your meth on the street, which I hope none of you are doing. <laughs> and if your chemist is using sodium cyanoborohydride for this reduction, what should you be afraid of? <laughs> Other than that. <laughs> Cyanide. That's right. How good do you think that street chemist is? Probably not very good. Probably a lot worse than you are. However, it turns out they don't actually use sodium cyanoborohydride because it's expensive uh, on the street. They use other reducing agents, which create other kinds of problems, too. But, uh, good? <laughs> Walter White actually used catalytic hydrogenation. And, oh, by the way, it doesn't turn blue, okay? That's... We had a Breaking Bad party for the last episode at my house for my research group, and somebody brought uh, blue rock candy. You know, so. yeah. yeah, it was it was fun. Actually, just so that you know, uh, the lady who taught me my physical organic chemistry when I was a graduate student actually was a consultant for Breaking Bad, and so I was a little disappointed that she thought it could turn blue. But. <laughs> Yeah, it was theatrical. It was. It did. Yeah, it became Walter White stuff, right? So, but the chemistry is pretty easy. Okay. So here we have a situation where if we want to create this primary mean through this what's called uh, reductive amination, this process is known as reductive amination. Why do we have that name? We're, yeah, we're making an amine through a reductive process. That's right. So sodium cyanoborohydride is a reducing agent. 
If we want a primary amine, if we think about this retrosynthetically, wherever that carbon-nitrogen bond is, I know that this part's going to be ammonia, and I know that this part has got to be an aldehyde. So ammonia reacts with the aldehyde, gives me the imine, which then gets reduced to the primary amine. What if I wanted to make a secondary amine with another? I react a primary amine with the aldehyde, right? And I can do that pretty easily. That's right. So this works really, really well with aldehydes. The reason that we don't use sodium borohydride <coughs> is because sodium borohydride readily reduces aldehyde ketones. It will reduce imines if you can form them first. But the nice thing about sodium cyanoborohydride is I just mix everything together. Sodium cyanoborohydride doesn't reduce aldehydes or ketones very readily. It's very slow at doing that, and why I, I, it's still a, kind of a mystery to me, okay? Because if I push the arrows, I still see why it should reduce it. But it's, it's a lot faster at reducing an imine. So as the imine forms, it gets reduced by the sodium cyanoborohydride, and, and the reaction works pretty well. Now, we all know that amines can function as nucleophiles. We've learned that, right? They can also function as bases. And so if you take an amine, in this case a primary amine, but also secondary tertiary amine, and we throw in an acid, right, we get acid-base chemistry occurring, right? So if we use a strong acid, which way is the equilibrium going to lie, to the right or to the left? Right. To the right. We always favor the weaker acid, weaker base pair, right? And so these ammonium salts have a pKa somewhere around 10-ish. So if we're using HCl here, for example, equilibrium is going to lie completely to the right. Okay? Actually, if you're even using a carboxylic acid, the equilibrium will lie completely to the right. So for example, here we have a primary amine. We have HCl as a pKa of minus 7. We form the ammonium salt, which has a pKa of just under 11. The equilibrium lies this way. Notice they actually show a little bit of the reverse reaction, but the equilibrium lies so far to the right that we could consider it to go to completion. Here we have a carboxylic acid, right? And so this also will lie to this side, and you form an ammonium uh, acetate, since we're using acetic acid here. Uh, and so the equilibrium, all these reactions, goes to the right. So we can actually use this to our benefit. So let's suppose Obrey has an amine and an alcohol that he needs to separate. I don't know, he was sloppy in lab and he accidentally poured an alcohol into his amine. Not that surprising, Not that surprising <laughs> right? And so he wants to separate back out the amine because that's what he really needs. And he wants to get that done before I come back and see that he's messed up, right? He wants to keep it all hush-hush. Well, it turns out you could actually distill it, but distillation, as you all know, takes a long time, right? He could do column chromatography, but that takes a long time. But he could simply take this mixture and put it into a separatory funnel with water. These molecules will be more or less soluble in water. Okay. He can then add some HCl and some methylene chloride. And when he adds the HCl, what does the amine do? It gets protonated, right, because it's a base. And so it gets protonated and we form a salt. The alcohol is left alone. Now wait a second, I thought alcohols reacted with HCl to make alkyl halides, right? So why is this left alone? Huh? Yeah, but that doesn't have anything to do with it. It's a true statement, but irrelevant. <laughs> they are gonna be in different layers. What else? When we were taking alcohols and converting them into uh, alkyl chlorides, we typically had to boil it, right? What's the temperature here? Room temperature. So, yeah, the alcohol, if I left it for about three years, it would eventually convert into the alkyl chloride. But Obrey's going to be done quicker than that because he doesn't want me to find out about it, right? And so now we have a situation where we have a salt, and our salt's more or less soluble in water. They are. They're more soluble in water, right? Whereas the alcohol, which isn't charged, is going to be more soluble in the methylene chloride because it's got six carbons. It doesn't satisfy our five-carbon rule, right? 
So what Obri does now is he simply mixes this together, puts the cap in, shakes it up, lets the layers separate, right? Drains the lower methylene chloride layer, which contains the alcohol, and he puts it over here. And he goes, oops, there's my mistake, right? And then he takes the top layer, which is water, and it contains this salt. Now, how does he get his amine back? How did, and how is he going to do that? What base? That's not a base. That's a reducing agent. Well, it, it's in water. Sodium hydroxide. So now he takes this water layer, he puts it back into his separatory funnel. He adds sodium hydroxide and brings the pH to about 10, 11, 12, somewhere around there. Right? It's not an exact science. You just till the pH paper turns really blue. And then he's going to add methylene chloride again, and he's going to shake it. And the deprotonated amine will go into the organic layer, and he'll separate that out, and he'll be able to get his amine back. And he'll get that done in about, to be honest, he should be able to be done with that process in about 10 minutes. So I typically take 45 to 50 minutes for lunch. So he's got plenty of time to correct his mistake before I get back. The evidence is gone. That's right. It turns out that this process is actually very, very important for the discovery of new drugs. Uh, one of my uh, professors when I was in graduate school was a very famous marine natural products chemist. And his group twice a year went to Hawaii and did dives, dives off of Hawaii and collected these specimens. So everybody wanted to join his group because number one, you got to learn how to scuba dive. And I don't like the water that much, so I didn't want to join his group. But uh, you learned how to scuba dive, and you got to spend two weeks twice a year in Hawaii. Pretty cool deal, right? So the Hawaii part I would have liked. Uh, I don't know about swimming with the sharks. All right? And so they would come back with these samples of these sponges and other things that they collected. And what they would want to do is separate the basic components from the acidic components from the neutral components to kind of get a rough separation of the different types of things that are in these animals, okay? And they would actually use this type of process. So when they wanted to separate the basic components out, like the amines, they actually took the stuff, ground it up, put it in a separatory funnel, added HCl, all the basic components went into the water and did all this, and then they could take those products and go look at them, separate them by other techniques. Uh, but, the, you know, again, the, the take-home message is, is that this basic kind of process is actually used uh, for some serious research. <coughs> Excuse me. If you look at the pKa of the amines, here we have ammonia and here we have ethylamine. Why is it that ethylamine is more basic than ammonia? Why? That's just a statement. What is it about that alkyl group that makes it more basic? It kind of does, yeah. What does it do? We know that alkyl groups, if we think back to our electrophilic aromatic substitution, they're electron donors, right? So if I take a lone pair and I have a group that wants to donate electrons to that atom, what's it going to do? Make it more basic or less basic? It's going to make it more negative, if you think of it that way, right? And so it's going to become more basic. And so it turns out that secondary amines are actually more basic than primary amines, and tertiary amines are just about the same as secondary amines, but uh, maybe a little bit, okay? But they're all more basic than ammonia, okay? And so this is why the uh, synthesis of primary amines from ammonia is actually a bad idea, because these products are actually more basic. The more basic, the more nucleophilic. The more nucleophilic, the faster the reaction, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> Explain what you're seeing here to me. Why is pyridine a weaker base, or excuse me, a weaker acid than uh, pyrrolidine? Why is the 
pyridinium ion, a weaker acid than Hmm? Okay. Okay. I'll buy that to, a, to an extent. What do we know about pyrrole and pyridine? They are. Absolutely. So yes, these are both aromatic systems, right? But this lone pair of electrons is actually part of the pi aromatic system. These electrons are not. So when I protonate these electrons, what, what can I say about my product? Is it aromatic or non-aromatic? Going from here to here, is it still aromatic or not? It is still aromatic. So it turns out that pyridine is actually a stronger base than pyrrole. Pyrrole's electrons do not want to be protonated because you end up losing your aromatic character. And so if you protonate the pyrrole, you really need a really strong acid because this has a pK of zero. Pyridine, you can make <coughs> a salt out of it pretty easily. All right. <coughs> now we learned <coughs> in the alcohol chapter that we can eliminate water from an alcohol to get a carbon-carbon double bond, right? And what did we use for that? So if Sarah takes a secondary alcohol and she wants to eliminate water to get an alkene, what reagent would she use? Would she use a base? <coughs> Sulfuric acid is a good one. What were the others? There were three dehydrating acids that I taught you. Phosphoric acid and paratoluene sulfonic acid. Are there others? Yes. But those are the ones I want to hold, hold you responsible for. <coughs> well, it turns out that if you have an amine, you can actually eliminate ammonia to get a carbon-carbon double bond. The problem, however, is you can't do this using sulfuric acid. Sulfuric acid simply reacts with the amine and you form an ammonium salt. And it stops there. So we actually have to trick this into being a better leaving group. And the way that we do this is to first alkylate the amine with methyl iodide. Notice it says excess. So what's going to happen there? Gabriella takes a primary amine and she throws in an excess of an alkyl halide What's the product that she's going to get? A salt, a quaternary ammonium salt. And so what she's going to get out of this one, let me draw it up here, will be this quaternary ammonium salt. So we'll have three methyl groups, and they used iodide, right? Yep. That's going to be the salt that she gets. In the second experiment, or the second step, they throw in what's called silver oxide in water. They didn't put the water up there. Anytime you see silver oxide in water, think of it as silver hydroxide. It is not silver hydroxide, but think of it as silver hydroxide. Thinking back to your gen chem, what's going to happen? I've got this quaternary ammonium salt in solution. It's got an iodide counter ion, and I put it in solution with silver hydroxide. What's going to happen? And what's going to happen? It precipitates, right? And so the silver iodide precipitates out as a solid. And then what happens? We have just swapped the counter ion. We've taken the iodide out as a precipitate, and the hydroxide is left behind. Does anybody know what this is called? No, that's the name of the overall reaction. But this process, where I'm swapping one anion for another, it's ion exchange. 
I'm exchanging one ion for another. Okay? Is iodide a good base or a weak base? Very weak. What about hydroxide? Pretty strong. It's kind of counterintuitive. I went from a weak base to a stronger base. That's against everything I've taught you, right? But what's the driving force here? The precipitate of the silver iodide. That's why it happened. Okay? And now, Gabriella takes this and just heats it up, boils the water. Now what happens? Help me with the mechanism. Now what happens? And so you get your carbon-carbon double bond, plus you get water, plus you get trimethylamine, which is a gas, which bubbles out of solution and smells like rotten fish. It's nasty stuff. So if you ever do this Hoffman elimination process, you'll know it's working. Believe me, don't do it outside a hood and don't wear your Sunday best. Okay? <clears throat> so we can actually eliminate, essentially what we're eliminating is ammonia. We're essentially eliminate NH3 but we have to trick it into being a good leaving group, okay? And so we do that by over-alkylating it and then exchanging the iodide or whatever the counter ion is for hydroxide, and we can do this, okay? Now, you might be thinking, why do we need another way of making alkenes? It turns out that the Hoffman elimination has some special uh, results for it. When we were eliminating water from an alcohol, we got the most substituted alkene, right? Notice what we get in the Hoffman elimination. We get the least substituted as the major product. And that's kind of neat because now I can make more substituted alkenes or I can make le less substituted alkenes, right? And so this process actually favors what we call the Hoffman product. So you learn that there are Zaitsev alkenes and there are Hoffman alkenes, and Hoffman alkenes are the least substituted. Explain this to me. Why should this be any different? Okay. It is all about steric hindrance. Remember, this group, right, is this small or, or big? It's pretty big. It's like a T-butyl group, right? So if I'm hydroxide and I'm coming in here to try to remove this proton, I got to get in the way of this big thing and this methyl group. It's kind of tough to get there. But it's a heck of a lot easier to get here because there's not another group flanking it, right? So it's all about kinetics, whichever one can get formed first. So you can actually get the thermodynamically less stable alkene out of a Hoffman elimination than you can out of the elimination of, of an, uh, water from an alcohol. Um, if I put it in acid, it would, yes, and let it sit long enough. It would certainly equilibrate, okay? Now, I'm going to show you some real chemistry that I did as a graduate student using this type of chemistry, all sophomore-level organic chemistry. 99% of research kind of chemistry is really sophomore-level organic chemistry, okay? So here I have what's called xylene. It's paradimethylbenzene. What's going to happen when I take this and, and uh, shine a bright light on it in the presence of n bromosuccinamide? I'm going to brominate one of the benzyl carbons, right? And I'm going to get an alkyl bromide. And it turns out the yield here is actually quite good, almost quantitative. Now I've got a leaving group, right? I then took this and I reacted it with trimethylamine. What's going to happen now? Pardon? It is exactly an SN2. So the nitrogen lone pair is going to attack here, and I'm going to form a quaternary ammonium bromide. Kind of what we need for Hoffman elimination, right? Now here's where things get really interesting. I take this and I mix it with silver hydro or silver oxide and water, and I exchange out the bromide for the hydroxide and I get this compound. 
Is that aromatic or non-aromatic? It's non-aromatic. How did that happen? Yeah, which one did it attack? It does. So there's a hydrogen, there's three hydrogens here, right? The hydroxide attacks and removes one of those hydrogens. That's how you get the double bond here. And that moves that pair of electrons and that leaves as a leaving group. And that's how you get this, what we call uh, paraquinodimethide. And don't worry about that name. Do you think that that species is reactive or non-reactive? Very reactive. And in fact, it reacts in two pathways. One pathway I wanted, the other pathway I just had to live with. Okay? But these things will actually dimerize to form what's called 2 2 paracyclophane. What? No, it is just non aromatic. Okay? And two of these actually come together and click together, if you will, for those of you who know anything about click chemistry. And you form this so called 2 2 paracyclophane, where you have two benzene rings that are actually on top of each other and bowed a little bit, they're so close to each other held together by these two ethane bridges, as we call them, okay? And it's kind of cool because the two aromatic rings are so close together that they actually talk to one another. And I know that sounds weird, but if I do something on one ring, the other ring knows that it's happened. And so we have electronic communication across space. And so my boss was interested in taking these and making conductive polymers because the pi systems actually make what some people call, and I know it sounds weird, a pi way where things are actually communicating with one another, okay, through the pi system, okay? Yeah, so, um, so we took these and we nitrated the aromatic ring, and once you uh, nitrate the aromatic ring, the other aromatic ring knows that it's been nitrated and it becomes less reactive too, and so we were playing with the chemistry of these things. The other thing that happens with these things is they go and form a polymer called perylene. And perylene is a very valuable polymer. And the, uh, so we would take the polymer off, we'd actually throw it away because it's not very useful uh, once it's formed. Uh, but the polymer itself is actually used to coat high-end electronics to keep uh, oxygen out. It's a very good oxygen barrier. And so you can actually take 2,2-paracyclophane and reverse this reaction and make this and then spray it on an electronic through, through a hot gun, basically. And you can, you can polymerize on the surface this so-called polyperylene, which uh, has a lot of, lot of interesting properties. But we were interested in making this, <coughs> and it turns out that the yield of this sucks overall. You get about 5% yield on this, uh, and it turns out that at least at the time, it's not so much anymore because gold has gone up, but at the time that we were making this, we did the calculation, and this was about three times as expensive on a per mass basis than gold. And so... Uh, we had it in a little bottle and we kept it locked up because it was very valuable stuff. But notice this is all sophomore level chemistry, right? A l uh, benzylic halogenation. What kind of process is this? Uh, it's a free radical reaction. An SN2 reaction. Anion exchange, uh, focusing on the fact that silver bromide precipitates out of solution. And then just heating something up. You all do that all the time, right? and getting the product that we wanted. <clears throat> this took me about four days to go through, uh, but at the end I got something very valuable that I could use in a variety of experiments. Amines also react with nitrous acid. Does anybody know what this molecule is? NaNO2? What's the name of it? Sodium, that's a good start. <laughs> sodium nitrite. That is exactly right. Where do you know of sodium nitrite? If you like sausages, you've probably eaten sodium nitrite. It is a preservative. It is a pretty darn good preservative. Okay. Sodium nitrite will uh, <coughs> preserve your sausage. It keeps the sausage red as opposed to looking like it's browned and aged. Red, it keeps red meats red. And so butchers add it to packaged meats for that purpose. But sodium nitrite reacts with hydrochloric acid to generate nitrous acid. 
And it turns out that nitrous acid will react again with hydrochloric acid to form the NO plus ion, the nitrosonium ion, which is a strong electrophile. Now, if I'm eating sausages with sodium nitrite, what's in my stomach? HCl. And so I form this nitrosonium ion in my stomach. There are warnings about eating too, min too much nitrites because it's not particularly healthy for you because you're generating the nitrosonium ion, which reacts with primary amines and secondary amines, which your proteins are made of, right? <coughs> exactly, or your amino acids in your proteins, right? And so you can imagine a lot of chemistry occurring that can cause some problems, okay? So it turns out that if you take a primary amine, sodium nitrite and HCl, you actually form what's called a diazonium salt. And these things typically fall out of solution. This is a process called diazotization. This occurs so easily, it's literally just mix everything together and, and the stuff precipitates out and you're done. The problem is, this looks like nitrogen gas, right? With just an alkyl group on it. It wants to lose nitrogen very, very easily. And some of these, especially if you have very few carbons, will lose nitrogen extremely quickly, explosively actually. And so working with these can be dangerous. Usually there's a, there's a six carbon rule. So if you have six or more carbons for every nitrogen or amino group, usually you're okay. So you can actually isolate these so-called aerial diazonium salts pretty easily. And this actually functions as a pretty good leaving group. And so we can use that to our advantage. Now the mechanism is pretty straightforward. You've got the nitrosonium uh, ion. The primary amine reacts, as you might expect. We've got a nucleophile. We've got an electrophile. We've just made a nitrogen-nitrogen bond. <coughs> this hydrogen is now acidic, so the chloride abstracts it, and you end up with what's called an N-nitrosamine. These are carcinogenic. This is why eating sausages can lead to cancer. But they taste so good, right? At least I think so, right? But these N-nitrosamines actually will react further with hydrochloric acid. You can end up protonating the oxygen. You end up then removing this hydrogen in what kind of looks like an SN2 process. You then form this species that now has an alcohol, if you will, on it. That gets protonated, that leaves, and you end up with the diazonium salt. It's a pretty straightforward mechanism, okay? But the take-home message is primary mean, sodium nitrite, HCl, we're going to get diazonium salts. And these diazonium salts are actually useful in a variety of reactions, which we will pick up with on Monday. So no class on Friday. Have a good, good Friday. <laughs> Study a little bit. <clears throat> it's your birthday? On Easter? Happy birthday, right? Oh, come on, that was good.